Trent Park is a country house located between Enfield and Barnet in North London. One can go to it via the underground station the Cockfosters and from there it's a walk of around one kilometre. During the Second World War, Trent Park, nicknamed the Cockfosters Cage, was used by the British government as a special camp for high-ranking prisoners of war. The rooms were bugged by the British Secret Service. It was assumed that in the relaxed atmosphere of the camp, where officers could enjoy the privileges that they might have assumed came with their rank and waited on by British staff, they might talk more freely. To this end, the rooms were bugged and the conversations monitored by British intelligence. During the course of the war, 84 generals and a number of lower-ranking staff officers passed through Trent Park. Some valuable information which might have affected the course of the war was gleaned from their conversations. But as far as this presentation is concerned, I'm just going to concentrate on the war crimes that were discussed there and in particular how this dispels the myth, if it still exists, of the clean Wehrmacht and the cowardice of those officers who did nothing to stop Nazi crimes. The archives were not opened until 1996 and the resulting conversations show that some of the officers should have been put on trial for crimes that they committed. The officers held here were from the Wehrmacht and the Luftwaffe. Only one SS officer was held in the camp. He was SS Brigadeführer and Major General of the Waffen SS Kurt Meyer. After the war he was sentenced to death for the murder of Canadian POWs but the death sentence was commuted and he was released. I might do a separate video on him. Trent Park House has a history that dates to Henry IV of England. The house itself in 1909 came into the possession of Sir Edward Sassoon and on his death in 1912 it was inherited by Philip Sassoon who was the cousin of the British First World War poet Siegfried Sassoon. Sir Philip Sassoon was quite a character. Noted for his hospitality, guests to the property included Lawrence of Arabia, Winston Churchill, George Bernard Shaw, Charlie Chaplin, the future King George VI, then the Duke of York, Lord Balfour and many more. He was openly homosexual and despite being Jewish and amongst other people appears to have been in a relationship with Prince Philip of Hesse, a member of the Nazi party as from 1930 and future SA Organ Gruppenführer. Sir Edward died due to the complications of influenza in 1939 and on the outbreak of war his property was requisitioned for, by, for use by the British government. The Trent Park operation was the idea of Thomas Kendrick who had headed the British secret intelligence service in Vienna in 1939. He found a Scottish aristocrat, Lord Aberfeldy, who was to be the prisoner's welfare officer. He was a cousin of King George VI and his role was to befriend the German generals. He let them know that his cousin, the King, was insistent that the captured officers were treated in accordance with their status. To this end, he took them out on day trips, shopping to places like Harrods and out for meals at high-end establishments such as the Savoy Hotel and Simpsons in the Strand in London. Part of this aim was not only to gain their confidence, but also lull the prisoners into talking about subjects with their fellow officers once Lord Aberfeldy was not there. However, Lord Aberfeldy was not a cousin of the King, nor was he a lord for that matter. Nor was his name Aberfeldy. In fact, he was an MI19 agent named Ian Munro. However, the situation that existed at Trent Park suited the prisoners too. For the captured officers, life in Trent Park had its perks. The rations were simple, but probably much better than their families were getting in Germany and they also had the benefit of British whisky. There was a large library, a lounge, and they could go for walks in the extensive grounds where the English King Henry IV had hunted some 550 years earlier. This all may have been conducive to loosening their tongues whilst talking to each other. 
after World War II and now living in a democratic West Germany, most former generals refrained from their self-critical reflection on what they did during the Third Reich. This started a myth of a clean Wehrmacht. The professional army had nothing to do with Hitler and the Nazi regime, they said. They only learned about the atrocities committed by the SS and the Einsatzgruppen after the war. However, the recordings from Trent Park show something completely different, and they did indeed talk about the Commissar Order, the massacre of the Jewish population, the treatment of Russian and Soviet prisoners of war and the shooting of hostages and the plundering of the occupied territories. At the beginning of the war there were a few German prisoners there and those that were held there were of comparatively low rank. However, bugged conversations of prisoners held there allowed the British to learn of how Luftwaffe planes managed to find cities in the dark through use of radio signals which the planes literally through, flew through. Once that secret was out, then all the British had to do was to jam their signals. They also later learned of the rockets and as a consequence, the Pinamunda base was bombed. From 1942, generals and other high-ranking individuals fell into British hands and it was these that revealed uh, what they knew about Nazi atrocities. Major General Walter Bruns recounted in great detail how he had witnessed a mass shooting of Jews near Riga. The pits were 24 metres long and about 3 metres wide, he said. The Jews had to lie down like sardines in a can, heads towards the middle. Six submachine gunners were above them and they shot them in the neck. When I arrived, the pit was already full, so the living had to lie down on the dead, and then they got shot, so that the space in the pit was used to the maximum. They had to be correctly layered. Before that, however, their possessions were stolen. That Sunday, there were three pits. The queue of people was 11 to 12 kilometres long, and it was gradually advancing. It was a queue of death. Walter Bruns was captured at the end of the war, so this conversation took place once the details of the Holocaust were known. However, we must ask why he continued to serve the Nazi regime until the very end, given that he knew what was happening. Lieutenant General Friedrich Freiherr von Breuch was born to an aristocratic family in 1896 in Strasbourg, now in France, but then in Germany. On the 26th of August 1939, shortly before the start of the Second World War, von Breuch was given command of the 34th Reconnaissance Battalion. After being promoted to colonel on the 1st of September 1940, von Breuch took over the 22nd Cavalry Regiment and during the Soviet campaign, the 1st Cavalry Regiment, which then became the 24th Cavalry Brigade on the 1st of December 1941 and was later again renamed this time to the 24th Panzer Grenadier Brigade. Whilst in the Soviet Union, he witnessed something he described thus. We passed a camp where about 20,000 Soviet prisoners were being held. They howled like animals at night. They had nothing to eat. Then we marched down the street. There walked a column of 6,000 stumbling figures. They were emaciated and supporting each other. Every 100 to 200 metres, one to three got stuck. Alongside were cyclists, our soldiers with pistols. Anybody who stayed down was shot in the neck and thrown into the ditch. Von Breuk was later transferred to Africa. On the 12th of May 1943, von Breuk was captured with the rest of his division near Gombalia in Tunisia. He was transferred to Trent Park on the 1st of June 1943 after he had been promoted to Lieutenant General. He was repatriated on the 7th of October 1947. General Dietrich von Kolditz is remembered today as the last Wehrmacht commander of Paris and is often thought of as the person who saved the city from the destruction that Hitler would have caused it. Here we can see him signing the document of surrender for the French capital on the 25th of August 1944. He came from an aristocratic family. His father was also a general and what today one can visit the ruins of the family chateau at Wonka Prudnitska although it was then called Grachlika Visa, located now close to the Polish border with Czechia. 
but then it was the German border with Austria. He was recorded as saying, The most difficult task that I have carried out, although I carried it out with the greatest consistency, is the liquidation of the Jews. According to the general's son, Timo von Holditz, who was born in 1944, this is a forgery or an error. He points out that there's no evidence that any massacre committed by a unit under his father's command. And Sonka Netzel, the author of the book, Abgehört, Deutsche Generale in Britische Kriegsgefangenschaft, accepts that the location for the massacres committed by his unit are not known. Timo von Holditz further points to a conversation at Zaporozhye on the 16th of February 1942 between Field Marshal Erich von Manstein and his father, Major General Dietrich von Holditz. This was published in Der Spiegel on the 2nd of April 1962. I asked Field Marshal von Manstein if he would take part in action against Hitler. Manstein was sitting in an armchair reading the Bible, quickly, almost embarrassed, he put it aside and covered it with papers. Then he turned to me. The enemy's superiority, against which I have been fighting for years, has increased from 3 to 1 to 20 to 1. In view of this, the thought of simply wanting to drag the Führer's headquarters to kill Hitler while millions of Russians are waiting in front of me ready to jump into Germany is ridiculous. At the head of an army group, I am responsible for the German people and, as an army commander, I cannot think for a minute about making a change in leadership by force. The son further points out that his father maintained contact with people within the German resistance and that he refused to carry out the commissar order which demanded that Soviet commissars be shot. I would argue that there's no doubt whatsoever that the 17th Army, to which von Holditz belonged, did commit major crimes. The first one that comes to my mind is was at Poltava. This included, of course, mass murders against Jews, and that the conversation with Manstein probably happened in 1943 and not 1942. Furthermore, there were a number of people in the German resistance who did carry out crimes against the civilian populations in the occupied areas. Luftwaffe Major General Gerhard Bassinger was born in Ettlingen near Karlsruhe on the 18th of November 1897. He served in North Africa and was captured in Tunisia on the 9th of May 1943 and was held prisoner of war until the 2nd of October 1947. In December 1943, he mentioned the number of 5 million murdered Jews. He probably got this information from Luftwaffe General Georg Neufer on the 10th of July 1943. Neufer was clearly quite shocked about this and referred to 3 million Jewish victims. Where Bassinger got his number of 5 million from is not known, but it's very close to the truth as it was at the time he mentioned it. Possibly he got an update from other captured officers which was not recorded by the books. Bassinger may not have been previously aware of the atrocities, but in any case he took the opinion of fellow inmate General Wilhelm Ritter von Thoma that Hitler had gone insane and that the Nazi war effort was doomed. This caused dissension amongst the generals, and as the object was to get them to talk in confidence, which they might not do in front of officers they disagreed with, Bassinger was moved to another camp. Major General Gerhard Bassinger sent a memorandum for the British Prime Minister Winston Churchill in which he outlined the concept of a National Committee West, intended as a response to the National Committee of Free Germany, founded by German officers in Soviet captivity. Unfortunately, the British did not take him up on his offer, which might have got together an effective anti-Nazi Union of Germans. It seems as though rumours of the Auschwitz death camp had reached some of the generals. In December 1944, Lieutenant General Heinrich Kittel reported, In Upper Silesia, they just massacred people in a factory. They were gassed in a large hall. Kittel was well aware what was going in the Holocaust. He had witnessed at least one mass shooting whilst serving with Army Group North as from August 1941. He reported it thus. 
They seized three-year-old children by their hair, held them up and shot them with a pistol and then threw them in a ditch. I saw that for myself. One could watch it. The Sicherheitsdienst, the SD, the security service of the SS, had roped the area off and the people were standing watching from about 300 metres away. The Latvians and the German soldiers were just standing up there, looking on. Kittel was then a colonel and presumably could have pulled rank on the SD, but he didn't do it on this occasion. However, once he did pull rank, during a conversation at Trent Park, he said he'd once stopped an execution by the Sicherheitsdienst, but not because of his sense of justice. He said, if you shoot people in the forest or somewhere where no one sees it, well, that's your business. But as far as this execution was concerned, he didn't want corpses to pollute the well he got his water from. The bugged conversations at Trent Park show that some high-ranking officers approved of the persecution and murder of the Jews. Some of them professed to be radical anti-Semites and only criticised that the implementation of the extermination programme had attracted too much attention. For example, Colonel Hans Reimann said in October 1944, the Jewish thing in Germany was absolutely right. You would only have to do it more quietly. The most extreme case was that of General Ludwig Kruvel. On the 29th of May 1942, Infantry General Ludwig Kruvel's plane was shot down over the British lines in North Africa after his pilot lost his way and mistook British lines for Italian positions. University educated, Kruvel had served in the First World War, then during the Second World War had commanded the 11th Armoured Division in the Balkans and the Soviet Union. At the time of his capture, near Gazala, he had hastened to defend himself against rumours that he was responsible for massacres in the neighbourhood of Kragujevac in Serbia. Kruvel was brought to Trent Park on the 22nd of August 1942. A bug caught him saying, World history will one day prove the fewer right that he recognised this great Jewish danger for all peoples. It used to be called Kengis Khan and then it was Attila the Hun. This time it is Jewish Bolshevism, which is breaking through Europe from the vastness of Asia and which we must oppose. Kruwell was 40 when Hitler came to power, so there can be no claim that he was brainwashed by the regime. However, there were also dissenting voices. Horrified by the full extent of the crimes which he first learned about at Trent Park, Major General Johannes Brun, commander of the 553rd Volksgrenadier Division declared, We've sinned. As representatives of this system which we have lived and it's against all moral laws all over the world. What has to happen with such a government? What has to happen with a people that does such things on a grand scale? One can only say that such a people must not win the war for the benefit of mankind. So the question that this all leaves us with now is what was done with this information after the war? <laughs> Clearly that we had people admitting to extremely serious crimes and that could have been used in trials. It would appear that Winston Churchill wanted to use it for war crimes trials, but he was persuaded against this. Why? Well, in the aftermath of the Second World War, we had Soviet imperialism, uh, it looked as though Stalin could advance and there could be a continuation of the Second World War, this time against the Soviet Union. Details of what happened with the interrogation, or rather the bugging of the uh, German POWs could have been used against the um, Soviet potential Soviet prisoners, or indeed prisoners from any other country with which uh, the British found themselves at war. So the result was that this was just forgotten about, put in an archive with the potential of using it classified, top secret and not rediscovered until many years later. Was that the right decision or not? 
to be quite honest, I think it was the right decision. Although, you might think otherwise. This video has given you a quick overview, but if you'd like some more information, there's a number of books you can see. The main source for what I've done here is the 2005 work by German historian Sonke Nietzel, Abgehört Deutsche General in Britische Kriegsgefangenschaft. So that's uh, translated, I think, as wiretapped journal, German generals as British POWs from 1942 to 1945. And this was one of the very first books that examined the surviving records, which were transcripts of the conversations. There's also the 2007 book by Genito Knopf, Die Wehrmacht, Ein Bilanz. And the 2012 book by Dieter Paul, Die Herrschaft der Wehrmacht. Deutsche Militärbesatzung und heimische Bevölkerung in der Soviet Union. In English, there's the book The Walls Have Ears by Helen Fry. However, what you could do now is to watch the excellent PBS Secrets of the Dead documentary on this very theme, a link for which you will find below and which goes into more detail on the early days of Trent House and the dispute between General Ludwig Cruel, who was an out-and-out -out Nazi, and the anti-Nazi General Wilhelm Ritter von Thoma. I have sort of um, skirted around the theme of this dispute in my presentation, but the uh, PBS documentary does it really well. So, thanks very much for listening. I upload every Friday at uh, 20 hundred hours my time, which is Central European time. My specialist area in history is the Holocaust, so there's lots of things related to the Holocaust, as well as uh, Nazi Germany and Soviet, uh, the Soviet Union. And uh, I've recently been doing a number of things related to the conflict in Ukraine. So, that's what you find on this channel. And if you subscribe, then you'll know when I am uploading. Thanks for listening.